I'm uh, tremendously excited to be here and uh, want to share with you some of the work that we do uh, in our lab. And it can sort of briefly be summarized by, uh, you know, sort of the simple statement, we listen, we listen to the world, um, both uh, ocean environments and terrestrial habitats, and really trying to figure out uh, how different ecosystems work. And so tonight, uh, over the next 15 minutes or so, will be a brief sort of entree in uh, starting to tease apart the different uh, acoustic constituents uh, of nature. So if we were to go out into, let's say, the woods, um, and we would listen, what would we hear? So this is a recording that I did uh, in the Maasai Mara uh, National Park in Kenya uh, a few years ago. Um, and there's a number of things that we can immediately take away from this. You know, while it's a uh, exotic uh, tropical location, um, the patterns of sounds that you, be, that you hear aren't particularly different than they might be if you just step right outside this building uh, in the evening. And when we have sounds, what we like to do, in addition to listening to them, uh, is we like to look at them. And so a lot of the work that we do relies on the visual representation of sound. And so for those of you that are musicians uh, in the audience, we look at, at sound scientifically in, in a same fashion. So we have, uh, we read, this is a spectrogram, we read it from left to right. Time is on the x-axis and frequency or pitch is on the y-axis. And so this is the representation of the sound that we just listened to. And you can see that uh, there's a lot of uh, activity going on here. Um, but notably, we start to see three different species of bats, several species of insects, and several species of frogs. And what becomes exciting about listening to the natural world is that with this single recording device, we can start to figure out who is all there, what are they doing, uh, and then if we start to record for longer periods of time, we can get an idea of how do ecosystems change, how are they composed, uh, and how do they vary uh, over space. And so when we go out into different habitats around the world, uh, it's not uh, too difficult to envision how different uh, ecosystems uh, each have their own characteristic sound. So someplace like this uh, savanna uh, with a river going through it might have a unique composition of birds and frogs and insects. And it's really not too difficult to take uh, the next sort of extrapolation and predict that it would sound very different from an environment like this that's going to be dominated by anthropogenic noise. Maybe you'll get a cardinal or two here, um, but it's certainly going to have a very different uh, composition of the soundscape. And so with these two examples being of, of different terrestrial habitats, we can then make that same leap uh, to ocean environments. And so uh, a nice pristine beach like this, both above and below the surface of the water, would have a very different soundscape uh, than a busy shipping port uh, like this. And so with sound in the marine environment not being particularly intuitive, the same rules about how we listen to sounds uh, and the role of sounds in uh, different ecosystems, uh, the same rules apply. When we think about sounds in the ocean, uh, the, f the immediate sounds that come to mind are those sounds uh, of the great whales. And so just do a, uh, a quick run through of some example sounds. Um, this uh, is a call, the contact call of a North Atlantic right whale, a uh, fairly tonal uh, short duration call. It's sort of that upward sweeping whoop. Um, and these animals will counter call to each other uh, with the sound. Um, but it's, you can see it's a fairly simple uh, call. And contrast that with a, the feeding uh, echolocation sounds of a sperm whale. Um, on the top panel, you have the, uh, the waveform. And then on the bottom is the spectrogram. And sounds something like this. Oh. 
So those are the sounds that sperm, feeding sperm whales will use to identify and then uh, hone in on their prey. Uh, we like to joke that that is the last sound a giant squid ever hears um, <laughs> before it becomes dinner. Um, and the fun uh, trivia of the evening is that the sperm whale echolocation clicks are in fact the loudest sound in the animal kingdom uh, at about 226 decibels uh, underwater. And then of course, the, uh, the classic example of, of underwater sound are the songs of singing male humpback whales. And you can see that from the spectrogram uh, of the humpback song, it's tremendously complex, filled with both uh, harmonic structure, uh, tonal repetition, and males will call for hours and hours and hours. Um, and the, the songs are actually culturally inherited among different populations uh, of uh, singing humpback whales. And so we can take, <clears throat> excuse me, take those sounds uh, and then look at their occurrence um, over broad swaths of the ocean. So from a project that we did uh, just south of uh, Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, we had three sensors deployed in the water. And here you can see uh, on these three different sensors the overlapping occurrence of not only singing humpback whales, but minke whales uh, and fin whales. Um, and so with just by having uh, recording equipment in the water, we can begin to understand um, how different whales are using this parcel of ocean. And we can do so uh, and record animal activity over long periods of time and broad spatial scales. But whales aren't just the only things uh, making noise in the ocean. Um, there are fish. And you know, as, a, as an intro to this, you know, when most of us see uh, underwater uh, scenes, we're used to something like this, where we've got lots of colorful fish in this reef in Hawaii, uh, things swimming around, things feeding. But what I find really exciting about this clip uh, in particular is that uh, I played it to you with the sound off. And so now, So within this coral reef habitat, just with this just short snippet of sound, you can hear a couple of different things going on. You've got this male damselfish defending his territory, trying to attract mates, chasing off other intruders. You're also hearing damsel, other uh, similar um, species calling in the background. Uh, and then you're also hearing this uh, sort of high uh, frequency crackling noise, which are sort of is the ubiquitous snapping shrimp that are occurring in all oceans around the world. But so for most of us that got into marine biology, and of course, you know, we worshiped uh, the work of Jacques Cousteau, um, his book, The Silent World, didn't do us bioacousticians any favors. And so what we are realizing is that the ocean, uh, and in particular fish habitats, are alive with sounds. So if we put this into an evolutionary context, this tree uh, sort of represents the family history of the vertebrates, uh, in particular the, the jawed vertebrates. And so here you have the major lineages of vertebrates uh, and where you have these uh, nodes. This represents a shared common ancestor. And the sharks, skates, and rays are the most basal. Uh, and then going up the tree are the most derived. And when we think about sounds uh, in the animal kingdom, we typically focus on, well, we know frogs make sounds and birds and reptiles, and of course, mammals. Um, but acoustic communication all started with fish. And so when we look at it in this representation, it kind of uh, changes your perspective to the, think about the fact that acoustic communication evolved in the ocean and then spread onto land. So this is a uh, nearly universal uh, mode of communication among the vertebrates um, that started in aquatic habitats. We've known about sounds in fishes uh, for 2,000 plus years. Aristotle was the first to write about them. Uh, but even Darwin uh, recognized that like singing birds, like chorusing frogs, uh, fish species are using sounds to attract mates and defend territories. Uh, and in a lot of this older literature, you know, these uh, sounds and songs are being described as musical. And the vocal anatomy that they use to produce the sounds are being described as uh, musical instruments. But what's exciting is that when we record in different parts of the ocean, 
we can rule out the, the whale sounds, or we can ide easily identify the whale sounds because there's very few species of whale. But what ends up happening is we get all these biological sounds that we can assign to, to fish, but we don't know which species are making the sounds. So as an example, uh, these are just uh, individual spectrograms of sounds that we recorded from a survey just off the coast of North Carolina. And these six sound types are most certainly being produced by fish, yet we have no idea uh, what species are producing them. Um, and so this field of underwater bioacoustics is very much still in a state of discovery uh, that is now uh, becoming increasingly enabled by the sophisticated technology that lets us do it. So while we don't understand uh, which fish are producing which sounds, there are several species of fish that we know their sounds uh, extremely well. Uh, these are two examples of the fish that we study, uh, the oyster toadfish and the black drum. Um, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, but if we start with the oyster toadfish, and so males defend their nest, honking uh, away, uh, trying to attract females to come lay some eggs. Um, interestingly, the uh, the sonic muscle that the toadfish uses to produce sound is the fastest contracting skeletal muscle among vertebrates. Um, so these are highly specialized uh, vocal organs used to produce these sounds. Um, and then to the right is this fish, uh, the black drum. It's low frequency sort of booming. Um, whereas toadfish uh, have, individual toadfish males have nests that they def uh, try to attract uh, females to, uh, the black drum uh, form these giant spawning aggregations. And so here's, um, some drum recorded off the coast of Georgia with some occasional calling. And you can see those calls uh, scattered over the course of the spectrogram. But when the reproductive season really gets going, they start producing a chorus similar to what you would hear in frogs. So the uh, source level in those sounds is 165 decibels underwater. Translated to air, it's about the same sound intensity as a jackhammer. Um, and these guys will call throughout the night. So here's about 30 seconds or so of the spectrogram of what we're seeing. One of the exciting things about looking at sounds uh, from these long-term recordings is we can start stepping back uh, over time. And so if this is 30 seconds, this is now 24 hours. If you were to start listening to the sound recording right now, it would take you until about 6.30 uh, tomorrow evening to get through this whole thing. On the left are, is the chorus of Black Drum, where you can see that they, uh, starting at midnight, will call throughout uh, the evening, um, ending at about sunrise. And then they pick up again at about 6 in the evening uh, and go until the next morning. So you take that 165 decibel sound, these choruses are lasting for anywhere between 8 and 12 hours. They are dominating uh, the soundscape. In contrast uh, to that nocturnal activity of black drum, uh, oyster toadfish just kind of keep calling all day long. And so these two lines represent the fundamental uh, frequency and the first harmonic uh, of their call. And you can see some noise uh, from passing ships in the background. So this is 24 hours. You can step back even further. This is now five months of sound. So we, this is off the coast of Jacksonville, Florida. We have January 15th right here, going till about the beginning of June. And what you can see within this uh, figure is the spawning activity for the season of black drum, then followed by toadfish. And as you'll notice that the toadfish frequency is increasing over time, that corresponds to an increase in water temperature. So as the water temperature warms, uh, the toadfish call at a higher pitch. So this is five months. Here is uh, five months across uh, five different years, where starting in 2009 to 2010, uh, basically going from uh, late fall to early summer, uh, we can see both the onset uh, uh, and duration of spawning activity of both black drum and toadfish. Again, these are off the coast of Jacksonville. And what you can see is uh, black drum always start calling first, and toadfish always start calling second, but when they start calling and for how long they call um, uh, is variable. It turns out that the, their calling activity is strongly linked to ocean temperatures. So as you can predict, 
um, with increasing uh, ocean temperatures from climate change, not only will the calling behavior of different species be uh, impacted, but also the overall soundscape um, in which their calling will change as a function of uh, directional climate change. Within the ocean, fish aren't the only, uh, fish and whales aren't the only things uh, making noise. And increasingly, humans are having uh, an impact on ocean ecosystems. So by far, the, the biggest source of sounds of humans in the ocean is that from global shipping. Um, it sounds something like this. Whoops. I will spare you that. That's 20 minutes of a passing ship. Uh, and part of the, one of the challenges that uh, marine animals face over the course of a passing ship is this concept of masking, where if you're trying to uh, talk to another member of your species and having a droning ship go by, your sounds may be washed out completely and different animals can't hear each other uh, talk, so to speak. And so uh, when you have different species relying on uh, sounds and communication for uh, fundamental aspects of their life history, masking presents a, uh, a huge uh, impact. This is a, a representation of shipping traffic just in New England. So here we have Cape Cod, uh, Massachusetts, and these red lines represent uh, ship tracks. Um, so you can see that even uh, going through uh, Boston and Rhode Island, is this tremendous source of uh, shipping activity. And if we look at the Pacific Ocean, here we have each of these yellow lines represent uh, different uh, shipping tracks. So uh, shipping, commercial shipping is blanketing the ocean. Another source of sounds from humans is that associated with geophysical seismic surveys used in oil and gas uh, extraction. And these sounds uh, are a sort of a downward uh, uh, pointing a controlled explosion where they send sounds that uh, reverberate off the seafloor and then are picked up to fit, look where oil and gas deposits are occurring. They sound something like this. Hmm. Media not found, that's unfortunate. It's an explosion, about 220 decibels. Um, each of these are about a 100 millisecond pulse in duration spaced anywhere between eight and 10 seconds apart. But when you go to an industry scale, the ships doing these surveys will be producing uh, surveys with uh, anywhere, uh, you know, up to 100 uh, air guns um, with streamers, you know, potentially going a, a kilometer across and 16 miles, uh, or excuse me, 16 kilometers uh, back behind the boat. So really a, a tremendous amount of acoustic energy resulting from uh, seismic surveys. And in a place like the Gulf of Mexico, where you have a, a significant amount of oil and gas exploration, this spectrogram represents uh, about six months in the life of the Gulf of Mexico acoustically uh, from about here, where all of this yellow and red is all air gun surveys. Um, and so basically there are uh, areas of the Gulf of Mexico that are blanketed uh, by air guns. So not to end on a down note, we're starting to understand tremendous amounts about the ocean uh, just by listening to uh, calling animals. But humans are having an increasing impact on ocean ecosystems. So this map uh, for, uh, published uh, by Ben Halpern and colleagues from science shows human activity in the world's ocean. So the heat map, basically the orange and red are areas of high human impact, uh, and the cooler colors are lesser impact. And you can see that very few places in the world's oceans are untouched by humans. A little bit in Antarctica, a little bit in the Torres Strait, um, but Southeast Asia, uh, Europe, uh, New England uh, are, are hot spots of human activity. And this includes uh, noise as well. And so part of the, the challenge is trying to understand how do ocean ecosystems work, how do humans impact uh, how these animals are using the ocean, and trying to do so in a way uh, before we start having uh, uh, species loss. And so, um, this brief overview sort of sets the stage for what Jolie Harrison will talk about in a little bit on how, now that we know about sound, um, how do we regulate it? How do we balance um, both uh, what the animals are doing with, uh, with human activities? So thank you. <laughs>